He say he would find himself by taking in signing, signing the peace treaty between factions. He would have been the one to actually represent the Greek pan pantheon. Word would spread to other factions about this apparent peace treaty afterwards. During not to these three factions, uh, the angels, fallen angels and devils, they were all able to come to an agreement with the Greek pantheon's Kratos, or at least the reincarnation of Kratos when it came on to signing a peace treaty well that really just surprised everyone the Norse pantheon especially would be surprised to when it came on to hearing this they originally thought that Odin had killed Kratos and that was the end of it they never thought that Kratos could ever be reincarnated Odin would of course be the one the most interested about this. He wanted to check this out. He wanted to meet this reincarnate of Kratos one day. He was curious to know if he ended up retaining his strength or not. He remembered how his fight against Kratos was one of the hardest yet. And when it came on to his strength over the years, it began to also, well, how should I say it, decrease, you could say. He was not necessarily in his prime, even when he was fighting Kratos. His strength was only becoming weaker and weaker throughout the years, the centuries, but his knowledge would continue to grow. That was the only way he was even able to truly defeat Kratos through his knowledge of magic. But when it came on to now, hearing that there's a reincarnate, well, Odin wasn't wasn't too sure if he could truly actually defeat this Kratos, if this one actually retained their strength. That is. Now, when it came on to Issei, though, he would try to keep a low profile, despite all the news that was now revolving around his seemingly return. He wouldn't be too concerned with what these pantheons had going on after all. He just wanted to mind his own business most of the time. Sir Zex would, would end up approaching Issei one day though. The reason for this being because of the fact that he was curious. He was curious as to how Rias' team had become so strong back when they fought Rias' peerage. Even if Issei didn't really know much about of why Rhea seemingly wanted him to train to train her team at the time. All that was really explained was that hey, he can make a good amount of money off for just training them. And it seemed that they train that his training method was really effective. When Sir Zex ended up asking his sister about it, the girl and their peerage would end up informing him about the fact that they trained under this mysterious dude, this rather strong kid from their school who was seemingly even stronger than most of the peerage at the time. Rias wasn't too sure if the kid was stronger than herself in Akino though. This was basically Rias trying to save face because of the fact that, well, it would look embarrassing to say that some random kid from their school was seemingly stronger than even her, it would just either show that she was weak or that this kid was not normal at all. Well, even more not normal than he already was. And she didn't really recall seeing him with much of a, um, of a sacred gear either. Well, more like she just never really saw him use anything of the sorts. It just was a head scratcher for Rias at the time when she explained that to Sir, to Sir Zex he became interested as well but now after seeing what Issei was capable of 
he realized that Rias was most likely referring to him back then. Because of this, Sir's ex would actually request a favor, a favor from Issei, that favor being to train Rias' Rias's peerage once again for an upcoming event. He would be willing to actually pay Issei any amount he saw fit. When it came on to Sir Zex and his influence, money wasn't really an issue for him. Issei would hear, would hear Sir Zex out and simply sigh. He would accept the offer since he really had nothing better to do. The season for most of his favorite sports was basically over now. And Rias would be none the wiser either. I mean, he would be making a very good profit too. So, he really just saw this as like, there's really not much of a choice here. There's not, there's not many other options I could go for. So, may as well just take this opportunity to, to cash in a check. So, of course, Issei would end up being willing to train Rias's peerage and she would not actually expect to see Issei on top of one of the mountains within their family's region. Rias was aware of the fact that they would be training in order to prepare for her eventual match against against Sona, but that was about it. She didn't she did not necessarily know who was going to be training her. She wasn't expecting to be trained in this fashion either, with the first thing Issei doing was hurling a boulder at their group. The whole time that they were actually training, it would be more like a life or death situation. Issei would literally punch the ground at times, causing it to splinter. Several spikes would be formed from the rocky surface that they ran on. When they came onto Rias's peerage, they would attempt to fight Issei, but each and every time they would find that they simply held no match against him. Their best bet was trying to improve their own fighting capabilities in order to get some sort of leeway, leeway with Issei. Issei was more of a physical fighter with some resistances, um, rather than simply being one of those magical casters you could say. They were trying to use that to their advantage, although even Rias went stand a chance most of the time throughout this training they would try to uh, they would try to up their magic scales by having their magical reserves become stronger over time but they would also develop new skills in order to find ways to counter Issei's overwhelming strength. Rias would end up learning how to harness her own power of destruction. She would learn to shape it into an to an into an aura around herself. She could use it to temporarily be untouchable for individuals within her level of strength or, or weaker. It was quite a draining ability though, so she could only use it for 5 minutes at a time. She would use it to basically try and erase some of the areas, basically trying to destroy some of the areas around Issei. And whenever she did destroy an object, it would usually end up exploding from the disappearance of the matter. When it came on to Akino, she would specialize more in ice and lightning magic. She would begin to create ice barriers around her opponent before shooting lightning through it. When it came on to ice, she would find it to, find it to be a rather conduct, a conductive form that, well, would have electricity pass through it rather easily. She would try to use that to her advantage against Issei. If it wasn't the barriers that she was using, she would make sure she covered something in ice. Even the floor, she would be willing to cover in ice and send electricity through, shocking opponents from far away. The electricity would carry on so long as there was ice covering the surface floor. Gasper, well, he would learn to rewind a person's body back to a previous state, allowing for a form of healing, although he couldn't use it very often. It also helped bring back their mana reserves. Konako, well, 
she would develop an or and she would develop aura blasts after becoming comfortable with the necromata form. She would use it in order to make mid to long range attacks since she couldn't complete since she could not necessarily compete with Issei in close combat, especially trying to go blow for blow, fist for fist. Because each and every time that she tried to do that, she would end up losing in the end. Kiba would have taken up the taken up the ability to create his own army of dragon knights who were capable of wielding holy swords. Unfortunately, he could not create that many at a time. At most, he was only able to create around eight soldiers that would be able to fight Issei. Well, not really be capable of, but and just be able to hold off Issei for like a couple of seconds. So, although they didn't necessarily last long, the little amount of time that he could spare would be worth it in Kiba's, Kiba's opinion. If he could bring that 4 seconds up to like 6 seconds, that meant an improvement in Kiba's book, no matter how little the improvement was. The newest member to the Rias Peerage, Zenobia, she would be intrigued with Issei's strength. She would be wielding Durandal when fighting Issei, although she always lost. She would learn better hand-eye coordination during this time though. Not only this, but Issei would comment on how she could probably use that dimension magic for something more than simply storing away a sword. Zenobia would begin to ponder about this and trying to focus more on learning about these pocket dimensions. She would end up finding out that she could use said pocket dimension in order to consume and reflect some attacks when it wasn't being used as a storage space. When Issei was about to go and punch her, she would open up a pocket dimension which would have his hand go through it or like his fist and then the fist would appear right right behind him, hitting him in the head. But Issei would, would of course be holding back so it wouldn't affect him that much. It would just rattle him for a little bit but he would get back into fighting position. Overall the group would have become even more capable than the last time they than the last time they had trained with Issei. And for people wondering about Asia she would have learned to to just mess around more with their familiar. Basically when it came on to her familiar being a dragon, of course she would have tried learning more magic with her familiar. So she would just end up learning how to cast draconic magic you could say. Instead of just simply being an, being a healer, being like the mercy of um Rias's peerage. Anyways, Issei would simply collect his earnings from Serzex afterwards. He would consider leaving the underworld though, but he would end up staying just to observe the place. It, intri it intrigued him. He would end up hearing about there being a kidnap kidnapping attempt on Konako as well by her oldest sister. But he would laugh hearing that her oldest sister was not expecting for Konoko to be as strong as she was. She was apparently far stronger than when she last saw her. Kuraka would have drawn too much attention to herself during this, during this time and she would be forced to flee the situation. Issei would smirk hearing this and he would go on to watch the match between Rias's team and Sona's own. Sona's team, they were, they were rather capable individuals. They had been trained by Tanin, but in the end, when it came on to Rias's team, they would have won the whole match. They would find that the match was rather close, with no one having a definite edge against the other. Rias's group would move on to have a match against another young devil, this one going by the name of Theodora. Issei would find himself enjoying these matches a little bit and he would stay to see more but of course on the day of Rias's rating game 
match against Diadora, the viewers, they'll be shocked to see the Chaos Brigade. They just suddenly arrived and they interrupted their match. Diadora would begin to laugh though. He would laugh hysterically and declare his allegiance to the Chaos Brigade. He would snatch Ostia and leave. The Grimmery Peerage, they will follow Diodora though and take him down. Shalba would arrive though at the last second. He would try to toss Ostia into the dimensional gap. Issei, he would arrive right in time though and he would crumb the blonde haired girl. Kiba would be relieved to see that Issei ended up being the one to save Ostia. He was worried that and that she would end up actually being thrown into the dimensional gap where practically no one would be able to save her. He would have been devastated if something like something like that ever happened to her. Issei would stare down Shalba right after though. Now Issei wasn't the one to really get involved in most deity affairs but he did sign a peace treaty with the three biblical factions. Him stepping in to save one of the members from the group sounded fair in his opinion. It was fulfilling his side of the, deal, of the deal. You scratch my back, I scratch yours essentially. That was basically how the deal worked. And he would also be taking down a common enemy. He was honestly getting very annoyed with, the, with this chaos, brig chaos brigade stuff. The Chaos Brigade. The Chaos Brigade was the whole reason why he ended up coming out of hiding in the first place. Because of the fact that he was basically dragged over to that situation. And the Chaos Brigade was causing way too much of a mess to where he lived. Then of course you had Valley trying to fight him, only for him to realize that, well, He's basically way too weak in order to actually fight Issei. Issei didn't even use his sacred gear in order to fight, well, Valley. Now this Shalba person decided to cause a ruckus alongside the Adora. These two were seemingly working together until Shalba, Shalba decided to off the Adora. So not only was this guy seemingly working for the Chaos Brigade, but he was also a traitor to his colleagues by trying to kill them. It just made no sense to Issei and in his mind he didn't he didn't really deserve to live. Azazel would holler would holler to Issei though and Issei would turn around before quickly catching a pair of weapons. He would observe said weapons and find it to actually be a pair of blades. Blades like that he had within his first life. His eyes would widen. Shalba would sweat with a cold look Issei gave him. Before he even realized it though, Issei would strike, chopping his head off. Azazel would inform Issei of the fact that they were able to actually retrieve his famous pair of blades from Odin. Odin, the Elder God, wanted to meet with Issei one of these days and he had been storing, well, he had been storing those blades for a while now, keeping them as a sort of trophy, like a sort of remembrance of how he used to be. Basically, his fight against Kratos being one of his toughest yet. And in the end, he was only able to get Kratos through some trickery. It was a bit shameful, but at the same time, he would find that it would have been worth it. Finding out that Kratos was reborn, he found that, hey, he might be stronger than last time, so why not give him his blades back? Especially if we want peace between these factions. Well, he was hoping to see him at the alliance meeting too. That was the main reason why Odin gave Issei back his blades. Basically to establish a sort of camaraderie from early on. So that there wouldn't be any bad blood between the two. And when it came on to the alliance meeting that would 
be happening soon, and he was really hoping to meet Issei there. Issei would raise an eyebrow though, hearing about the fact that Odin was the one to hand off the blades. He did not necessarily know how to feel about the god, but he had a change of heart ever since the last time they met in his old life. It had been years since he had last seen Odin. Well, well, probably more than just a couple of years. For all he knew, it could have been hundreds of years. And with those hundreds of, hundreds of years, for all Issei knew, the god could have had a change of height. Maybe the maybe Odin could have became an actual decent god for all he knew. When it came on to his fight against Odin, it was just two fathers trying to protect protect their belongings, trying to protect their kids, just trying to just trying to be good fathers, he didn't really have much spite for Odin beyond the fact that he was the one to kill him. He kind of respected Odin and the fact that he wasn't the most malicious god out there. No, he was rather just trying to protect his prop trying to protect his property. And Kratos was the one kind of making a ruckus back then. So Issei would decide to take this as a seemingly olive branch trying to see like maybe this would be his form of trying to make peace between the two. Issei would end up hearing about there having been an attempted assassination of Odin later on in the week though. But Issei doubted that Odin was any was was in any real danger though. Because after all Odin was really strong, at least the way that he remembered him. He remembered Odin being a rather strong god, even stronger than some other gods that he had faced within the Greek pantheon. He was probably, like when it came on to comparing Zeus and Odin, well, Zeus was more physically capable, but when it came on to when it came on to the depth of magic, well, and simply put, Odin basically outclassed anybody he had met up and up until then. When it came on to magical reserves, basically, like how knowledgeable Odin was in magic was just insane. That the just how much he was willing to go, just how far Odin was willing to go when it came on to learning magic. It was quite insane when hearing when hearing the legends of all that Odin went through in order to learn just more about magic. How uh, basically how far Odin was willing to go for knowledge of all of these different magical arts. Now, when it came on to the alliance meeting though, someone would actually end up disturbing the treaty that was about to be made. Of course, this would have been Loki. Loki would have been the one to actually attack the area. He would have had an army of wolves the size of Fenrir and have clones of the world serpent at his side. During all of the commotion though, Issei would be focusing on Loki. They seemed familiar to him for some reason. Issei would stare into Loki's eyes. Right then and there, he would, rec he would recognize the true identity of Loki. Right then and there, Issei would charge forward. He would slay most of Loki's army with ease. Everyone within the room, they would be amazed with how, e with how Issei was easily able to contend with Loki's army just by himself for crying out loud. Issei was slicing down as many opponents as possible. Loki would be unnerved with how strong Issei was, especially with how easily he was taking down his army. And Issei was slowly approaching him as well. But he would hear one famous word one word would snap him 
would snap him out, basically causes him to recognize who Issei once was. This one word being MIND THE TONGUE BOY! Well, a couple of words you could say in this situation. This was basically what Issei would have said as soon as Loki would have questioned what kind of monster Issei was. But after hearing, <clears throat> after hearing that statement, Loki would immediately see Kratos within Issei as they charged toward him. Loki wouldn't even be able to attempt to block Issei's attack now. He was too distracted. Issei, Issei would hit him with the blunt end of one of his blades though. It would knock Loki unconscious. But once Loki was defeated, Issei would request one thing, that being to talk to him. That, that being to talk to Loki when he woke back up. Everyone would be hesitant of allowing this except for Odin. Odin would have understood the, the situation and he would explain that Loki was actually Kratos' son. Allowing the two to catch up after so long was only fair. Once Loki woke up, he would find Issei sitting, sitting on the other side. He would have been given a cold stare from Issei, but they would eventually soft, soften up. The two would begin, to, would begin to talk and they would catch up with each other. With each other. But through catching up, Issei would actually interrogate, interrogate his son Atreus about why he decided to try and wreak havoc on the other gods. Atreus would begin to get angry hearing this. He would point out how Odin was the one, you know, Odin was the reason for why Kratos even died in the first place. All those centuries ago, he wanted to start Ragnarok by killing Odin ever since he heard about this, about the myth. He wanted to make it a reality and restart. He wanted to restart everything. He was sick of this world ever since I, ever since he lost the last parental figure in the form of Kratos all those centuries ago. And look at him now. Look at who, look at who Issei was now. He was siding with the gods now. This wasn't the father he knew. Issei would explain that it was time for them to turn a new leaf though. As Issei, Kratos began to embrace change and truly realize that not all, that not all gods were bad. There were good and bad gods alike. Atreus would just continue to refuse to accept what Issei was saying. He claimed that Issei wasn't even his father. He, he claimed that Issei was just a reincarnation of him. He wasn't his actual father. He was not... He was not his father as far as he was concerned. As far as he was concerned, Kratos was dead and the person that he was talking to was just a mere illusion. Just something that these guys trying to whip up in order to mess with his emotions, trying to get him to lose his focus, trying to stop Ragnarok from happening, and trying to embrace change. Yeah, right. Look at what's happened with trying to embrace change. Look at what's happened throughout all of these years. Throughout all of these years, Loki suffered. He became Loki because of the fact that his father died to Odin. He died because of the fact that his Kratos ended up dying because of the fact that Odin was the one to actually use trickery against him. And he thinks that these gods could have changed throughout all of these years? Yeah, right. As if he could believe any of that. Issei would have realized, would have realized that his words weren't actually going to make it through to Atreus at all. The words would have cut deep, but Issei would leave the room, realizing that Atre Atreus was too far gone. Atreus would be sealed afterward. Memories of his first family. They would resurface during the night. He, he would be frustrated. He killed his own wife and daughter in his first life. It was the whole reason he ended up going on a journey of vengeance to begin with. 
the further he went, the more he realized how horrible the Greek pantheon really was. They were the reason for why he lost his younger brother as a child. The gods were the reason why his brother was the one to want to kill him. They were the reason why he died in the end. But that didn't change the fact that he was a murderer of his own family. He could not necessarily he could not necessarily put the blame of the gods onto the fact that he was the one to kill his own family. At the end of the day, it was still his hands to kill his wife and child. That no matter how much he tried to um, put the blame onto others, he was still the one to have the blood on his hands. He was the one to have to walk. He was the one to have to walk throughout the centuries with the ashes of his wife and daughter on his skin. That was what made his skin so pale for so many centuries and now look at him he was reincarnated but the memories they still cut deep he would have looked at how Atreus developed he was never all that close with his son but he had become he had become so detached from Atreus now ever since he was reincarnated that he couldn't even communicate with them anymore. Atreus had gone on to follow the same path he originally went on, a path of vengeance and no matter how much he tried to talk to him, the boy, he wouldn't listen to him. He say he hated this. He would try to push all of it to the back, back of his mind though. He would be going on his school trip to Kyoto soon, after all. He had something to look forward to at least. On the day of his trip to Kyoto, Issei would end up encountering some yokai there. They would attack him only to realize the overwhelming difference in strength between them. Issei would calm them down though before... Well, more like Issei would calm down right before he was about to kill one of them. He would have noticed the youngest looking one there, they would have actually looked to be around middle school age. He would have softened up, he would have calmed down seeing her, seeing the pure fear within her eyes. She would have actually been known by the name Kanoi. When it came on to the situation, they would explain how it had really gone. Basically, they thought that Issei was simply one of, the, one of the culprits to have actually kidnapped her mother. Her mother being Yasaka, who was also apparently the leader of the yokai. What happened was that she had been kidnapped by these strange individuals and they thought that Issei was simply one of them and that they were coming to kidnap another one of their members as well. Another prominent member. But finding out that Issei was not one of them, she would of course apologize to him. And she would apologize for attacking Issei earlier. He would understand and accept the apology before leaving. He would end up getting confronted by the actual culprit though behind Yasaka's disappearance. He would find out that it was the apparent hero faction led by someone named Sao Sao. Frankly, Issei didn't care for what Sao Sao had to say. His title meant nothing to Issei. He just wanted to enjoy his school trip by the hero faction. He had no intention of allowing that. Issei would be forced to cut down most of the hero faction members. Sao Sao, he, he would begin to sweat, realizing how fast Issei was. He would, have, he would have to take this fight seriously now. Sao Sao would first shoot light at Issei, hoping to injure him, but Issei would actually dodge the attack. Sao Sao would try this a couple more times before switching tactics. After find, finding that Issei was too fast for his light projection attacks, he would try bombarding Issei with several blades made of holy power. Issei would use his own respective blades to deflect the onslaught though. 
Issa was getting aggravated now. Salsa would realize that simply trying to use the extension feature of his beard would just only end up being a, detri a detriment to him in, in the end and he would and he would decide against said ability. Instead, he would go into his balance breaker form. Well, he would have his true long longinus go into its balance balance breaker form with seven orbs suddenly appearing. And he would have several warriors created in order to stall Issei for a bit using one of said orbs. Issei would take the warriors down effortlessly, but Salsa would have activated, activated his greatest ability, General Treasury, in order to, in order to take down Issei. Salsa would attack Issei with the ability active, hoping to strike him down, but Salsa would find that would find the attack to have actually done some some damage to Issei. He would actually be relieved to see that this was a move that could actually harm this being known as Issei, but he would be shocked to see him heal from it right after. Issei would chop off Sao Sao's right arm after. Sao Sao would hiss in pain. Issei wouldn't be finished though, but Sao Sao would actually attempt to teleport Issei away from the location that they were in using horse treasure. Sure enough, it would work, but Sao Sao would, would be shocked seeing Issei charge right, right back at him not even 5 seconds later. Sao Sao was positive that he teleported Issei away though. Issei would confirm that, well, Sao Sao did teleport him and that he actually had to run all the way back here from after getting teleported to the North Pole. He was pretty angry about that. Sao Sao, he would get punched in the gut afterward. Sao Sao would feel an intense amount of pain from the attack, but even then, Issei was, Issei was holding back. Sao Sao would use this moment would use this moment in order to get rid of something troublesome though. This being Issei's blades. Sao Sao would use real treasure in order to shatter Issei's blades. Issei would be shocked to see his blade suddenly shatter, but Sao Sao, he would smake seeing this. His smake would disappear though, as it didn't appear Issei was slowing down at all. He thought that the planes were seemingly Issei's sacred gear, so he thought that removing that from the equation would actually help him in, help him in his fight against Issei, but it turned out that he was wrong. Issei didn't slow down at all, rather he seemingly he seemingly just got faster. Issei would sucker would sucker punch Sao Sao in the jaw and grab onto the boy's spear. He would shatter it with his bare hands, shocking Sao Sao to no end. He never thought it would be possible for someone to be able to destroy the true Longinus. It just made no sense to him, he could not comprehend it. Sao Sao would be bleeding from, would be bleeding profusely at this point. Sao Sao would realize the position he was in, and he would offer the location of Yasaka to him. Issei would halt his attack though, and listen to Sao Sao. Sao Sao would explain that he knew the location of Yasaka, and Sao Sao would have Issei follow him. Sao Sao would have been limping though, as Issei followed right behind him to where Yasaka was located. Issei would let Sao Sao live, but he would drag the boy down to the underworld. This would be after he brought Yasaka back to her faction though. While in the underworld, Sao Sao would be arrested. Yasaka would be inclined to ally with the other factions. Once she found out that Issei re represented the Greek pantheon and he was actually allied with the other factions as well. Hearing that such a strong individual was allied with the other factions meant that it would be it would be much more of I don't know I don't even know how to say it. Basically it would be 
around worth a while to actually ally with the other factions as well. When it came on to when it came on to Issei's blades though, he would actually get them fixed up by the other factions. He would actually get an upgrade from having the fragments from the True Long Giants combined into it. He will become capable of far more with this hybrid of weapons now. Issei would, would go back to school though and work on his extracurricular activities for the next year. Issei would become a person of interest though to Opus. Issei managed to bring fear to both Valley Lucifer and Cao Cao. Well, with, well, in Cao Cao's case, more like not only did he bring fear to him, but he was the one to actually subdue him. He was even able to destroy the True Long Giants with his bare hands, at least acqu according to rumors anyway. Ophis would want to meet with, with Issei, and she would make eventually make her way to Issei's house. They would explain how they were moving in, but Issei, well, he would refuse. Ophis would begin to power up though, trying to threaten Issei. They would try to establish that they were the one in the position of power here, not Issei. But Issei would step forward though, not intimidated in the slightest. The two would begin to fight only for Ophis to realize that she was at a physical disadvantage. Issei's punches, they they hurt and his blades, they were quite burdensome. Ophis would eventually surrender and suggest a trade offer. Issei was even stronger than Ophis so there was a chance he could take down the Great Red for her. If he could take down the Great Red, then, well, Ophis would be willing to finally go back to the Dimensional Gap. She would finally have the Dimensional Gap to herself again, and she would no longer bother Issei. Ophis would simply leave Issei alone from there on, but Issei wouldn't find the final offer to be fair at all. It sounded like he was just going to be doing Ophis' steady work with nothing in return. Ophis would sign before recognizing that there seemed to be something he was trying to suppress within his memory bank. Ophis would be willing to help fix that if he got rid of the Great Red for her. Is Issei would have heard of Ophis from the other gods at this point and he would agree to a challenge, not doubting Ophis' capabilities. If Opus did not fulfill her end of the wagon though, Issei would be forced to kill her as well for deceit. Issei would be transported to the dimensional gap where he would go all out for once. Opus would be surprised to see Issei's bite and rage used against the Great Red. Flames were practically being emitted from Issei's aura as he hammered down on a large dragon. The Great Red never stood a chance in the end. Issei would finish it, would finish Issei would end up finishing the dragon off by slicing him in half and dragging their body back to the underworld. He wanted the dragon scales to be used for armor after all, even though most people within this world couldn't hurt Issei at this point. Issei would be followed by Ophis too. Ophis seeing Issei's incomprehensible strength would find it to be charming in the end. Ophis would fulfill her end of the bargain though by blessing him with the ability to make the memories less painful. He would never truly be able to forget but he would at least be able to come to terms with it, come to terms with the whole issue of Atreus and the whole issue with his first family. From there, Issei would be recognized as the strongest being within, being within the world of EXD. Issei would graduate from high school and find himself getting enlisted into the pro leagues for American football, basically the NFL. Issei would end up becoming quite successful in his career, and for the first time, 
he say he would be truly happy, finally having peace. He would even have some offspring with the likes of Yasaka and Opus later on. Opus simply due to Elder Dragon's curiosity, they wanted to see if having some sort of offspring with the one known as Issei would allow for his stronger offspring to be born. They could only imagine the possibility of there being an even stronger being than, than Issei at this point and if Opus was the one to actually bear said child, well that would just be a plus in their book. When it came on to Yasaka, it was simply a way, a way of her thanking Issei for saving her so many years ago. Issei would hear about Rias becoming the head of the Grimmery family, and he would go on to applaud her too, seeing how strong she and the team had gotten. Issei would be at peace for would be at peace for once in his life. He would now know that no one would even bother trying to attempt to try him again and he could finally have a family where he did not have to worry about their lives being at stake 24 7. His kids were strong after all and well so were their mothers and that is how I will end off the series people. It is your boy King Tyne X signing out you guys already know the deal if you like the video like if you like my content you may as well subscribe Leave a comment and um, yeah, maybe share the video to some friends as well if they're into this sort of content. It is your boy King Tyne X signing out. Peace.